So a couple lessons ago, when we talked about the extreme value theorem, I mentioned that we had three big giant theorems that are super important in calculus. We've got the intermediate value theorem, which we talked about a couple of chapters ago. That's old news by now. We've got the extreme value theorem, which we just covered, and then I mentioned another one called the mean value theorem, and here it is, MVT. So that top sentence, mean value theorem connects average rate of change with its instantaneous rate of change. So let me kind of sum up using an example, because I know many of us are familiar with physics, we're familiar with this whole velocity, average rate of change of position type of idea. So picture you're driving, and for some reason you decided you would calculate your average rate of change, your average velocity over the entire trip that you took. Um, and we did this, oh gosh, we did something like this a while ago and we said, you know, your cottage is 280 miles away and it took you three hours and 15 minutes to get there or something like that. I don't remember if those are accurate terms. But basically what the mean value theorem says, it says that if you calculate the average rate of change, that some point, so say, say that your average speed on the way up north was an average of 60 miles per hour. The mean value theorem tells you that at some point, if your average rate of change was 60 miles per hour, at some point your instantaneous rate of change was 60 miles per hour, which makes sense. If the average speed of your trip was 60 miles per hour, of course at some point you must have been going 60 miles per hour. And that's all based on the fact that your velocity was continuous and it's differentiable and things like that. So that's the basic idea. I've got a lot of different ways that I'm going to rephrase it because it's kind of a tricky theorem. So hopefully with a couple different rephrasings, maybe a couple of pictures, we will get a good idea of what exactly this theorem means. So the actual theorem in actual math terms. Here's what we've got. If f of, s, f of x is continuous on the closed interval, differentiable on the interior, that's the open interval, and we saw that opening when we were looking at our last section. So we know that the continuous on the closed, differentiable on the open. Here is what is true then there is at least one point C there's at least one point C and C is an X value there's at least one point C in A to B that's the open interval at which F prime of C equals f of b minus f of a over b minus a. All right, so I want to make a couple notes on this just so we're clear on exactly what this means. So f of b minus f of a over b minus a, I'm hoping that we recognize that as a slope formula. This represents the slope of the secant line. This represents the slope of a secant line from a to b, the endpoints of that interval f prime of c, that represents the slope of a tangent line. Slope of a tangent line. So what this essentially says is that the slope of the secant line is going to be the same as the slope of one particular tangent line that we can find on that interval. And so if the slope's the same, that means they are parallel. So by the MVT, there exists at least one tangent line that's going to be parallel to the secant line. That's what this tells us. So let's you know talk about what this means, maybe draw on a little picture, something like this. So it's very, very, very important that we have these hypotheses here, that f is continuous and that it's differentiable. If the hypotheses fail, then no, you're, you're not necessarily gonna have a tangent line that's parallel to the chord AB, that's the secant line that goes from A to B. So let's talk about a couple of situations like this. Um, for example, so let's let's write one that works. So one that works, let's draw a little picture here. Okay, so let's say we've got a function that looks something like this. So, I don't know. Something like that. Alright, so here's what we've got. If we have A, so let's say that A is right here. Okay, and then let's say that B is, I don't know, right about here. So that goes up to this point. So when we talk about the chord AB, that is the secant line that goes between A and B. So here it is. So according to the mean value theorem, this function is continuous, this function is differentiable. That means at some point there must be a tangent line that's parallel to the chord AB. So basically what you can do is you can kind of just move the secant line in a parallel fashion 
until you get a tangent line to the curve. So you move it up and it's actually going to happen you know, maybe somewhere around there. You have a tangent line that looks something like that which would be parallel to that secant line. So this is all that this mean value theorem says, that somewhere, if we can take this secant line right here, somewhere we're going to have a parallel tangent line, which means the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change. So this works. This is one example, and that's because my function is continuous and differentiable. Let's look at one example where the mean value theorem fails, and that's because the hypotheses failed. So let's look at something nice and simple, just like an absolute value curve. All right, so if we say this is A, this is B, so we go from A to B. The slope of the secant line between those two points looks like this. It's just a nice horizontal tangent. But at no point, so say we drag this down, at no point are we ever going to have a tangent line that is parallel to that. So the mean value theorem fails, but that's because one of the hypotheses failed. This isn't a differentiable function. And if we drew some sort of non-continuous function, discontinuous function as well, we also would not be able to find what we're looking for, which is the parallel tangent line. All right, so these examples that we'll see, you'll see some examples like this in the book, is you're going to be trying to basically prove that something satisfies the mean value theorem. Okay, before I go on to that, I actually want to talk about Rolle's theorem, which is what we did in the last lesson. Rolle's theorem is just one specific instance of the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem is the more generalized one. So in Rolle's, value th in Rolle's theorem, we started by saying that f of a was equal to f of b. So if f of a is equal to f of b, this secant line had a slope of zero. So if the secant line had a slope of zero, we were saying that we could find a tangent line with a slope of zero. That was Rolle's theorem. That's kind of a, a specific instance of the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem is the more generalized one. Okay, so example one, we want to show that this function satisfies the hypotheses of the mean value theorem. So we're going to start with that. So showing that it satisfies the hypotheses. The hypotheses are that it's continuous and differentiable. So basically all we have to do is, is state it, but we do have to state it in order to say that we could actually use the MVT. The AP test will require that. So we can say that f of x is continuous. on the closed interval from 0 to 2. That's one thing they require. And we know this function. x squared, it's a polynomial, it's perfectly continuous, no issues there, and it's differentiable on the open interval from 0 to 2. Sorry, I started to write an a there, from 0 to 2. So it's differentiable, it's completely differentiable. This function is x squared, its derivative is 2x. That derivative doesn't have any issues at any point. So we start with that. That's what they mean by show the function satisfies the hypotheses. You can just state it based on what you know about these functions. So we start with that sentence. And then we know that the mean value theorem guarantees a point where the secant slope is the same as the tangent slope. So we start by finding the secant slope. So f of 2 minus f of 0 and then over 2 minus 0. So we have to set that up first. We have to find the slope of the secant line, and then we show that there is some sort of parallel tangent line on the interval. So f of 2, if we plug it in right here, 2 squared is 4, minus 0 squared is 0, and then over 2 minus 0. So we've got 4 over 2, which is 2. So what that says is that the average rate of change is 2. Let me draw you a little mini picture over here. So here's our parabola. We know what that looks like. So from 0, 0 up to the point 2, 4, right here. We just found the slope of that secant line. We found the slope of the secant line to be 2. That's what we just found. And then we're going to find that at some point during the interval, the instantaneous rate of change is the same. So we know that supposedly this is going to be equal to f prime of c. So we want to take the derivative first. The derivative is 2x. So at some point, this derivative is supposed to be equal to 2. And so that happens at x equals 1. So at the point x equals 1, which is right about here, at the point x equals 1, we have a derivative of 2, which would mean that the graph has a parallel tangent line. So the secant line between 0 to 2 is the same as the tangent line at 1. Okay, so that's what we're looking for there. So find a solution C, that's what we did. 
So that's how we work these. That's how we actually kind of prove the mean value theorem for a specific function, a specific value. Example two, we're going to explain why the following functions fail to satisfy the conditions. So our two conditions are that the function is continuous and that the function is differentiable. So let's take a look at this one right here. This one, we got to note real quick that this is equal to the absolute value of x plus 1. This one is something we forget. A lot of times we think that the square root of x squared is x. It's not. x squared is positive. The square root of something is always positive. So no matter what we plug in for x, we square it, we square root it, it always comes out positive. So this function looks like this. The plus 1 means we start right here. But it looks like that. It's an absolute value function. We should know by now that absolute value functions have this non-differentiable corner at x equals 0. Um, and it's just a vertical shift of the original absolute value. So again, there's this non-differentiable corner right here at x equals 0. So what we would say is that the function is not differentiable On, and then we state the open interval from negative 1 to 1. Because remember, differentiability should be occurring on the open interval. Continuity should be occurring on the closed interval. All right, so let's look at this one. Take a look at this nice little piecewise function. Let's graph it. So for x is less than 1, if we plugged in 1 right here, we'd get 1 cubed plus 4. So we know we're going to have an open circle here. And then let's see what the rest of it looks like. Like, for instance, if I plug in 0, I get 3. If I plug in negative 1, I get 2. This is starting to look like it must be. It looks like it's linear, but it's not. We know it's a cubic function, so let's just assume it looks something like this. Oops, what do we got going on here? Negative 1, the value, yeah, okay. So we're going to actually come up, I'm sorry, we're going to come up through this value, kind of straighten out here and go like that. Kind of ignore that piece on the side. All right, so that is a cubic function. We are ignoring this. Comes up here, it's like the little chair function, kind of straightens out here and then goes. So there's an open circle right there. Let's see what the closed circle would be here. If I plug in 1, 1 squared plus 1 gives me 2. So here there'd be a closed circle. And then this is just part of a parabola. So we know the side of a parabola is going to look something like that. All right, so this is my piecewise function. It doesn't have to be beautiful. The important point that we're looking for is this. We see right there we've got a break in the graph. Really all we needed to know is that the open circle does not meet up with the closed circle, and that's what tells us that our function is not continuous on that interval. So what we would say in conclusion um, is that there's a discontinuity at x equals 1. So we would just say the function is not continuous on the open interval. I'm sorry, the closed interval. So close, but it was right at 1 that we had that discontinuity. All right, so let's flip over. Look at some more stuff here. All right, to example 3, we've got this function set up, and then we have a point A and a point B. We want to find a tangent line on the interval that's parallel to the secant line. All right, so we're going to figure out exactly what this point is. We're going to plug negative 1 into the function. That's what that f of negative 1 represents. And then we're going to plug 1 into the function. So let's start with that. So f of, f of, whoops, f of negative 1, if I plug that in here, I've got the square root of 1 minus, and then negative 1 quantity squared is 1. So that's 0. So this is the point negative 1, 0. And then I can plug in 1. Square root of 1 minus, again, 1. So that's 0. So this is the point 1, comma 0. Okay, so we've got that. Now we want to find a tangent in the interval that's parallel to the secant line. Okay, so let's find the slope of the secant. That's just going to be a nice little slope formula. So f of 1 minus f of negative 1, and then all over 1 minus negative 1. So we just found those two function values, the f of 1 and the f of negative 1. 0 minus 0 over, and this comes out to be 2. So of course 0 minus 0 is 0. So the slope of the secant line is just 0. So what that means is we're trying to find a tangent line that is parallel, so we also want to find a tangent line that has a slope of 0. Or in other words, we want to know when the derivative is equal to 0. So we start with that. 
start by taking the derivative. Taking the derivative of this is going to require a little bit of a chain rule. We're going to bring the 1 half out front, leave the nested function in place when we drop the power down to a negative 1 half, and then we multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So the derivative of this expression right here is a negative 2x. Don't forget about the negative. It's because of this sign right here. So simplify up. So the 1 half is going to cancel with the 2. Don't forget that the negative is still there. So I have negative x over the square root of 1 minus x squared. That is my derivative. And I want to know when my secant line is parallel to my tangent line. My secant line has a slope of 0, so I want my tangent line to have a slope of 0, which means I'm setting my derivative equal to 0. So when I set my derivative equal to 0, all I need to do is set my numerator equal to 0. And so when I do that, I get 0. Okay, so I get x equals 0 right here. So we're going to set this up so my point, I end up with a horizontal tangent line. Okay, so where this happens at f prime, or sorry, I'm sorry, f prime is equal to 0 at x equals 0. So that means my graph would have a horizontal tangent line. All right, so I want to show you guys just a picture of this really quickly in the calculator just so you can get a little bit of a visual. All right, so let's graph this function. So my function is the square root of 1 minus x squared, which looks like this. So it's like this little semicircle. So let me draw you a bigger picture of it here. So a little semicircle just goes from negative 1 to 1. So something like that. So from this point, at negative 1 to this point at positive 1. My secant line obviously just has a slope of 0. So what I was looking for is a parallel tangent line. So I found that right here, when x equals 0, my tangent line would also have a slope of 0. And that's exactly what mean value theorem says. It says if I find the slope of the secant line somewhere on this interval, I'm going to find a tangent line that's parallel as long as my function is continuous and differentiable. All right. Interpreting the mean value theorem. Let's figure out exactly what this means. All right, so interpreting the mean value theorem. If a car accelerating from zero takes eight seconds to go 352 feet, its average velocity is 44 feet per second. What does this mean? Let's write something down there. So if a car accelerating from eight seconds, or from zero to 352 feet, takes eight seconds, its average velocity must have been 44 feet per second. So what does this mean? When we're talking about the mean value theorem, I actually talked about this at the very beginning. So here's what we know. We know the average velocity is 44 feet per second. The mean value theorem tells us that as long as the function is continuous and differentiable, an acceleration is going to be continuous and differentiable. So this means at some point, the theorem says, the speedometer must be exactly 44 feet per second. So at some point, during those eight seconds, must be exactly 44 feet per second. Okay, and that's exactly what the mean value theorem tells us. It tells us that as long as the function is continuous and differentiable, the average velocity is going to be equal to the instantaneous velocity at some point. So that's just a nice little interpretation, kind of in context. Okay, let's talk about increasing and decreasing functions. All right, so definitions right here. Increasing functions, decreasing functions. So let f be a function defined on an interval, and let x1, x2 be any two points on that interval. So a function increases on that interval if x1 being less than x2 implies that, that's what this double arrow means, it means that it implies that f of 1 is less than f of x sub 2. So what this basically says, so if x1 is less than x2, that means my x values are going up, it implies that my y values go up. So that's the definition of increasing means. It means that as my x values go up, my y values go up. Or if my x values go down, my y values go down. That's what it means to increase. Decreasing is exactly the opposite. This says if x1 is less than x2, meaning my x values are going up, that implies that my y values are going down. So increasing x values imply decreasing y values. In other words, I decrease as I go from left to right. 
So that's like the official technical definition of what it means to increase or decrease. Okay, let's write a couple little statements on here about increasing and decreasing functions. So start by saying a function is continuous and differentiable. This is where we're going to bring it back to our slopes, and we actually have talked about this quite a bit. So this is not going to be anything new. So let f be continuous and differentiable if f prime is greater than 0. That means my derivative is positive. If f prime is greater than 0 at each point of a, b, So if I can find an interval where my derivative is always positive, then what that means is that f is increasing on that interval. And we've talked about this before. This is nothing that's new. Positive derivative means an increasing function. And then vice versa, if f prime is less than 0, if my derivative is negative on an entire interval, then f is decreasing. Okay, so again, something that we have talked about before, not something that's brand new, but this is really the first time that I've actually done a little bit of calculus work to figure out when is a function increasing and decreasing. So we're going to start off with just a nice little example here. So the first example, when is x squared increasing and when is x squared decreasing. So what that means is we want to find out when is y prime negative and when is y prime positive. That's what matches up with a function being increasing and decreasing. So of course to find the sine of y prime we need to find y prime. So let's start there. The derivative of x squared is 2x so I'm starting you off with a nice easy example. So what we do, and I know that 2x is a very easy function to work with, but in order to find out when a function is positive and when a function is negative, we need to first find out when that function is 0. So I start by taking 2x and setting it equal to 0, and that breaking point is at x equals 0. So we actually we set up a little sign chart. This is going to be the sign of my derivative. And I know that my derivative is equal to 0 at x equals 0. So then I want to check my sign and see what happens at all the other points. So we talked about doing a little, little test point. So plug something into the left of 0. If I plug something into the left of 0, you know, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. If I plug that in here, I end up with a negative. And then I know that here I get a 0. So this is x equals 0, just to make that clear. And then if I plug in something above 0, 1, 2, 3, something like that, if I plug that in here, I'm going to get something that's positive. Okay, so that's what I've got for my little sign chart. If I plug 0 into the derivative, I get 0. So that's going to be like a horizontal tangent line, something like that, maybe either a min or a max. And then I have a negative derivative over here and a positive derivative over here. So what I say is y equals x squared is decreasing on, and I give the interval from negative infinity to 0. It's going to be an open interval because I'm not decreasing or increasing at x equals 0. And of course, I can't ever reach negative infinity. And I say because 2x is less than 0 on that interval. You always want to explain. We want to get in the process now of explaining because the AP test will always require it. And then we say x squared is increasing on 0 to infinity because, let's actually say, let's go with just a y prime instead, because y prime is greater than 0 on 0 to infinity. We mentioned up here that y prime is 2x, so we'll just call it y prime down here. Sorry about that. Okay, so I think that's a good breaking point for today.